Praise the Lord. Dear friends, this is a third reflection on the Lord's Prayer. We have been reflecting on this particular prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Jesus teaching about prayer, how he prayed, how he taught the disciples to pray, the importance Jesus gave to prayer. This we have been reflecting on the last two episodes. We have seen that the Lord's Prayer is reported in the Gospels of Matthew as well as Luke. And in these two reports, there is some difference. The report in Luke, or the prayer in the Gospel of Luke, is much shorter than that presented in the Gospel of Matthew. And it is quite probable that Luke is presenting the more original form of the prayer as Jesus taught it. Even though it is also possible that Jesus presented uh, two forms of the same prayer, a shorter form in Luke and later enlarged in the Gospel of Matthew. But the Bible scholars are of the opinion as a whole that the Matthean version is an enlarged edition of the prayer of Jesus, enlarged for liturgical purposes, for the Christian faithful and for the Christian community to use in prayer. Now, the prayer Jesus taught is presented as a prayer of the disciple. In the Gospel of Luke, the prayer is introduced by a question by one of the disciples of Jesus. The disciples saw that Jesus was praying, and impressed by the way Jesus was praying, one of the disciples requested, Lord, teach us to pray, as John the Baptist taught his disciples to pray. Then Jesus teaches them this particular prayer. So, in response to a request by a disciple, showing thereby that this is a prayer for the disciple of Jesus. The same is true also in the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5 to 7, present the Sermon on the Mount, a concise teaching of the Master, the summary of the Gospel is found in this section of the Gospel we call the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount is addressed not to the general public. Matthew specifies it. The audience of the Sermon on the Mount is a group of disciples. In chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, we read like this. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, so the Sermon on the Mount is a teaching of the Master to the disciples. From this, we could gather that this prayer is a prayer of discipleship. This prayer could be meaningfully said only by those who become disciples of Jesus. Of course, this prayer is a universal prayer meant for the entire humanity. All can pray this. All can use this prayer, but to be meaningful, to understand what Jesus teaches, to grasp the depth of the prayer, one has to become the disciple of Jesus. Now, teaching the disciples about prayer, Jesus pointed out the right attitude in order to pray. And this attitude is presented by Matthew. Two other aspects. Matthew specifies in the teaching of Jesus. First, you should not make prayer a show business. Don't pray in order to impress others or show that you are a spiritual person, that your prayer will bring you praise from the onlookers. No, prayer is a personal affair. Prayer is a personal affair with your God. So, 
you have to enter the secrecy of your heart. Enter your room, close the doors, and speak to your father in its secret. So the privacy, the concentration, the shutting off, shutting out of all the other worldly affairs, come close to God, be alone with God. That is the first attitude, to present oneself before God, forgetting all else, shutting down the doors of senses that brings distraction to your mind. So enter the cave of your heart. That's what Jesus says first. Second, prayer should be done with faith. You are praying to your father, praying to a person who listens, who cares. Don't multiply words. Don't keep on telling things as if God doesn't know any of this. Believe that the God to whom you pray is a God who knows you through and through. He is your maker, he is your father, so he knows. Pray with trust. So pray in secret, pray with trust in the Father. Now, with this introduction, the prayer is introduced. In the Gospel of Matthew, the prayer is introduced like this. Pray in this way. So this is a model of prayer. This is how one should pray, tells Jesus. Not necessarily using exactly the same words. Of course, that is what we can do. But the prayer is a model, a paradigm, an example how one should be praying. So the prayer brings in attitudes. The prayer brings in words that expresses your faith, your convictions. In short, this prayer is a gospel in nutshell. In this prayer, Jesus brings in the essentials of his gospel what he preached, what he taught. It tells us about God. It tells us about the world. It tells us about our neighbor and about ourselves. All the teaching of Jesus is somehow summarized in this short prayer. God, world, neighbor, and self, and the interrelationship between these. This prayer starts with an introduction, and an address and addressing God as Father. After this address, there are three petitions raised up to God concerning God and three petitions concerning ourselves. The address is for, followed by a petition concerning the name of God. Hallowed be your name. Then a petition concerning your kingdom. Let your kingdom come then about your holy will. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the attention first turns to God and to his name, to his kingdom, and to his will. When that is taken care of, then turn the attention to oneself. Then we are taught to speak about our needs, our bread, Give us today our daily bread, our sins, and our temptations. Forgive us our sins. Lead us not into temptations. So your, will, your name, your kingdom, your will, our bread, our temptations, and all our needs are presented. And this finally leads to another petition deliver us from the evil one. So in these petitions, three petitions concerning God and his kingdom, and three petitions concerning our needs, and finally expressing our fear of the evil one and deliverance from the evil, the prayer is concluded. So this prayer somehow sums up the gist of the gospel. Now let us take the first invocation the prayer starts with an invocation, a cry, so to say, Father. Father is the address 
the form in which we are asked to address God. Prayer is addressed to a person. All people pray to God. All those who pray are praying to one God or other. In the ancient world, prayer was addressed to various types of gods or the understanding about God were different in different people. Very often, God was considered as a mighty threatening force. The forces of nature were considered as gods. Wind and storm, lightning, or rain, seas and mountains and rivers, all these were considered gods. When man looked up into the skies, he saw the sun and moon and stars. All these heavenly bodies were also considered as gods. And people thought that these natural forces, what we call the natural forces, were gods guiding the destinies of the human beings. And very often, these natural forces did not have any consideration for the human beings. They were threatening the very existence. They were considered as capricious gods, and people had to placate them through sacrifices, through prayers and penitential services, and all sorts of activities, religious activities, accomplished in order to placate the wrath of God. The gods become angry for apparently no reason. Sometimes they show favoritism to some and hate others. Every evil in the world had been somehow attributed to the gods as the work of gods. People lived in fear. They tried to please gods by giving them sacrifices. And in this context, prayer becomes an expression of fear. But not always so. There are also some religions who conceived God as a parent, as a father, or as a universal mother. And sometimes this concept of father and mother were very physical, sexual, and giving origin to all sorts of interpretations, misunderstandings. Coming to the Old Testament, the people chosen by God, whom God chose as his own people, to whom he revealed in various ways, they prayed to God. But in the Old Testament, generally, God is seen as a mighty, almighty, powerful creator. God as a creator, God as the one who calls the, the people, one who guides the people, one who commands, gives the covenant, gives the orders, a mighty God. A mighty God who led the Exodus. A God who revealed himself to Moses as Yahweh, Calling God Father is not very common in the Old Testament. Even though there are some passages which suggest that people understood God as Father. For example, in the book of Exodus, chapter 4, verses 22 and 23, we read like this. God is asking Moses, Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. I said to you, let my son go, that he may worship me. In the context of Exodus, Israel is presented as God's firstborn son. The same idea is repeated by prophet Hosea. In the book of Hosea, chapter 11, verse 1, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Israel is presented as a beloved son of God. God calls and God guides Israel. The same idea comes in the book of Deuteronomy. The book of Deuteronomy, chapter 32, verse 6. Is not he your father who created you, who made you and established you? God is presented as the creator, as the redeemer, as the one who guides and leads the people. There is also a kind of tenderness 
and affection presented by this God. As in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 49, verses 15 and 16, in response to the cry of Israel, the Lord has forsaken me, my Lord has forgotten me, the prophet says, can a woman forget her nursing child or show no compassion for the child of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. See, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. God loving Israel with the tender loving care of a mother. Same idea comes in Psalm 27, verse 10. If my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will take me up. So there are some passages in the Old Testament that speak of God in terms of father. But very often, this fatherly concept is related to that of discipline. The father who demands discipline, who demands obedience, who demands respect. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 2. Hear, O heavens, and listen, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I reared children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. Israel is considered as child of God, a disobedient child. Then God takes up the role of a parent that complains about the disobedience. The same thing happens in the book of Malachi, chapter 1, verse 6. A son honors his father and servants their master. If then I am a father, where is the honor due me? And if I am a master, where is the respect due me? Israel, a disobedient child, who did not respect the father. In Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 19, I thought you would call me my father and would not turn from following me. So an unfaithful child, rebuked by the Father. So to sum up, what you find in the Old Testament, the Old Testament speaks of God as a creator, as a redeemer, almighty. There's also some passages which speak about God as the Father, but the Father of the entire nation, all the people. And again, even when the Bible speaks of God as the Father, the emphasis is on the need of respecting God, the need of fearing God, and obeying God. Never comes in the Old Testament that an individual person can call God as his own father. Here we see a difference from the Old and the New Testament. When we come to the New Testament and the way Jesus addresses God and the way he taught us to address God, we see quite a difference. Israel gave importance to the almighty, all-powerful God, the disciplining father. But all the same, they prayed to him often, especially when they were in need, when they were in distress. Isaiah 63, 16, we read like this. For you are our father, though Abraham does not know us, and Israel does not acknowledge us. You, O oh Lord, are our father, our redeemer from of old is your name. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to call you Father. We thank you for sending your Son to this world to teach us that you are our dear Father. Even though our earthly father and mother do not recognize us, do not acknowledge us as children, even though we often feel as orphans, you are our Father. We thank you for being our Father and accepting us as your children, through Christ our Lord.